All right, you're in the Psalm 50, and what we're looking at is the kind of worship that God accepts. Now, let me say right at the outset that the correct worship of God is a far more serious matter than, I suppose, the modern church has made it, perhaps more than we have made it. Psalm 50 is a psalm where God declares what worship he accepts and what worship he does not accept. And to those who engage in false worship, he says in verse 22, consider this, you who forget God, and I will, or I will tear you to pieces with none to rescue. How about that? Now, remember that in Psalm 50, God is not talking about those who worship false gods. He's talking about those who worship the one true God falsely. So let me say it again. The correct worship of God is a far more serious matter than we have made it out to be. Because to aim at less would be a goal that would be beneath him, God has made all creation for the purpose of worshiping him. I want you to notice verse 6. The heavens even proclaim his righteousness. You could stick an even in there. That is, they proclaim his attributes. That is what worship is doing. It's extolling who God is. Romans 1.20, a familiar verse, says God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, his divine nature, that is, God's attributes, who he is, have been clearly seen, being understood from what is made. Creation has extolled it, so that men are without excuse. As Psalm 19, verse 1, simply puts it, the heavens declare the glory of God. It's as though they, they worship. Uh, spiritual beings were created to worship God. That, of course, would mean angels. If you study the seraphim, they spend but seemingly most of their time, if not all of their time, worshiping God. Hebrews 1.6 says, when God brings his firstborn into the world, he says, let all the angels worship him. So because God created everything to worship him, Consequently, all human beings are natural worshippers. The only problem is they're either true worshippers or they're false worshippers. They're idolaters. Uh, Deuteronomy 8.19 says that if you forget the Lord your God and follow other gods, as if that was inevitability, if you forget the Lord your God, you could read it this way, you will follow other gods and worship and bow down to them. So God is saying that you're going to idolize something. And, of course, today we say, well, who's, who's following idols today? Well, where people don't outwardly worship idols, Ezekiel 14.3 says that men set up idols in their hearts. They idolize celebrities. They idolize the human body. And, of course, they even idolize food. We read in Philippians 3.19 that, that uh, there will be people whose God is their stomach, whose glory is in their shame. So, if you're saved, guess what happened to you? You have been saved from idolatry, from false worship, to worship the one true God, to be a worshiper of God. In Isaiah 43, 7, God says, Everyone who is called by my name, I created for my glory. And just a few verses later in verse 21, God adds, These are people I formed for myself so that, why did he create you? Why did he create you? That they may proclaim my praise. You're primarily created to worship God. And of course, God not only means that you were saved so that you could worship him in this life, he saved you so that you could eternally worship him. You go to the book of Revelation, and you, chapter 4, chapter 5, chapter 11, chapter 14, 15, 19, and 22, and you get a glimpse of heaven. And what's everybody doing? Praising. They're, they're praising and worshiping God. So what is true worship? Well, the first thing you have to establish is who is it for? You see, this, this is where there's a huge confusion. Is worship for me? Is, is it for me to lift up my spirits? Is that what it's for? Is it for lost people? 
because you can use it as an evangelical tool, get people into the church by bringing them into a worship service. Revelation 4.11 says, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. That's worship. You are worthy to receive worship, for you have created all things, and for your pleasure they were created. Now that tells us very clearly that worship is something that God alone is worthy to receive, and the purpose of it is for his good pleasure alone. It's actually not for your pleasure. Doesn't matter that you may find legitimate pleasure in it. The purpose is, are we giving God pleasure? Uh, it's not for lost people's pleasure for sure. I was reading John MacArthur, and he, he said, sadly, the church is now interested in finding out what the non-worshipper wants. People who have no relationship with God whatsoever, and the church is ready to redefine itself in the direction of the non-worshipper. In fact, churches measure their success on how many non-worshippers they can get into the building on Sunday. But Jesus said in Luke 4, 8, it is written, you shall worship the Lord God and him only shall you serve. So worship is to be directed to God, to God alone and for his pleasure. Okay, so that's who it's for. So how does God want us to worship him? Well, notice verse 14. It has to be worship that comes from the heart. He says, sacrifice, thank offerings. Now, he's just been talking about their outward form of worship. And when he gets to what it is he wants, he said, I want you to sacrifice, thank offerings. Well, genuine thanks can only come from where? The heart. Uh, Psalm 28, verse 7 says, my heart leaps for joy so I will give thanks to God in song. Then there's that passage that we all know very well in Matthew 15, verse 8 and 9, where Jesus is quoting Isaiah 29, and he says, well, these people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me. So notice, if you're worshiping with no heart in it, it's vain. That is, it isn't worship as far as God is concerned. So. First thing God wants is he wants worship to be from the heart. But it also has to be worship of the right God, the one true God. How do you know if it's the one true God? It has to be revealed in Scripture. God does not call it worship if you're just worshiping your view of who God is. Well, to me, you see, God is, and then you go off and prattle your own personal opinions as you, as you communicate your own designer deity. That, that's not worship at all. In John 4, 23 and 24, Jesus said, true worshipers must worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers that the Father seeks. God is a spirit and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth, in truth. Pilate said, what is truth? But Jesus, when he was speaking to the Father in prayer in John 17, 17, said, sanctify the believers through the truth. And then he added, your word is the truth. So you've got to worship the one true God if it's going to be worship. And that means it has to be in truth. That means it has to be who God reveals himself to be in Scripture, in his word. That's who I'm worshiping. John Piper says something wonderful. He says, the essence of praising God is prizing God. That is celebrating his worth. This requires a heart responding to a growing knowledge of the greatness of God as revealed in Scripture. The ultimate aim for your adoption is God's glory through your gladness at his greatness. So, we worship from the heart. It has to be from the heart. You have to be worshiping the right God. That's the one that, that was revealed in Scripture. And, and you worship because God is worthy of worship, not because you're going to get a good experience out of it. It's just because he's worthy. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 3, Paul defines believers as those who worship in spirit 
in the spirit of God. And now listen to this, this that's, that's the spirit they're doing it in, but notice what they're doing. They glory in Christ Jesus and they put no confidence in the flesh. That is feelings. That is, we worship by glorifying Jesus Christ and we put no value on our feelings. Now, you see, if you don't grasp that, you're going to go from church to church throughout causing trouble because you don't like the music. And you know why you don't like the music? Because it doesn't move your emotions. Because you think that's what worship is. Now, this is, this is why there's so many church fights over what? The music. They all come in to, to the church at the last place and every, every Monday, every Monday. I would say uh, out of 10 weeks, eight weeks, somebody was in the church on Monday saying what he didn't like about the music. And it was always inevitably the music I don't like. And what he meant by that is it didn't move me. Because he thought that's what worship was. But I say, I'm to worship God because he's worthy. That's it. Revelation 4.11, you, are, you, you um, are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor. That's why he gets worshipped. So what are the different ways I can worship God? There's two ways. And they come from Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15 to 16. He says, through Jesus... Let us therefore continually offer up to God a sacrifice of praise. Well, that lets you write right there that worship is not necessarily an emotional thing. It, 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 I can be doing it not really feeling anything at all, it, it, other than that I mean it. You see? It's not, it's not, it, it's, 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 I'm, he's worthy of it. Maybe I don't even feel like it, but I'm going to give it to him because God is worthy of it. And, and then he tells us how. The fruit of lips that confess his name. So worship is halfway, half of it is, is, is worshiping with your mouth. Didn't Jesus say from the mouth of, of infants and children, God has ordained praise? So through Jesus, let us therefore continually offer up to God a sacrifice of praise. Number one, the fruit of lips that confess his name. And number two, don't forget to do good to, and, to, and to share with others, for with such sacrifices, God is pleased. So we're told we also not only worship with the mouth, but we worship with acts of Christian love, God's love, sent to other people. And isn't that exactly what Hebrews 12.1 says? Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, that is, to God. That is, every action that you do that is done with, by your body for God. He said, you offer your body as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual worship. So worship isn't just singing a song. Worship is from your heart, but it's through your mouth and it's through your actions. Okay, now let's look closer at uh, <clears throat> Psalm 50 and look at what it is that God accepts and what it is that he doesn't accept. Let's start by making or drawing our attention to what is unacceptable to God. And of course, you probably guessed it, it's outward worship of God that, that is lacking any inward worship of God. If you like worshiping God with the mouth, while well, your heart is far from him. Thomas Manton in the 1600s, he says, If on the Sabbath day we sat a man stuffed with straw to sit in our pew for us and thought that that was worshiping God, it would be very absurd, but not one whit more than when we bring ourselves stuffed with dead cold thoughts that cannot rise to God. There are whole congregations like that where all is dead and only the outward form is present. And when you look at this psalm, you can see that between verse 7 and 13, God says, look, I'm not complaining about your outward worship. It's just in verse 14 and 15, he makes it clear that his complaint lies in the fact that all that outward worship was going on with no inner worship. Look at verse 14, sacrifice, thank offerings to God. Fulfill your vows to the Most High. 
call upon me in the day of trouble. So essentially he said, you're doing all this outward worship, but there's no thanksgiving. There's no commitment to me. There's no prayer. You're not even really talking to me. Daniel 6, verse 4 and 5, speaking about worship, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one. You are to love the Lord with all your heart and with all your soul. So if it's not, if it's not the heart expressing itself, it's not worship. Worship is an expression that comes from your heart. It is not an emotion that comes from a tune. Let me say that again. Worship is an expression that comes from your heart. It is not an emotion that comes from a song. In Psalm 82, verse 12, David said, I will give thanks to you, O Lord, my God. I'll worship you with all of my heart. So we can see that it is heart worship alone that is precious and acceptable to God. Also notice, therefore, it is quite possible to be outwardly worshiping and be spiritually dead. Now, look at verse 16. But to the wicked, and he's talking about wicked worshipers, God says, what right have you to, do, to recite my laws or take my covenant on your lips? So you're telling me, Paul, that there are people who don't care less about God, who never think about God, who maybe don't even believe in God, and they engage in worship? Uh, allow me to remind you of Matthew chapter 2, verse 7 and 8. Then Herod called the, the wise men secretly and found out from them the exact time when the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and he said, go make a careful search for the child. And as soon as you find it, report him to me so that I too may worship him. Uh, but actually in his heart, he wanted to murder him. And I wonder how many people on Sunday, they go to a worship service who, just like Herod, have nothing in their hearts whatsoever than to murder his name, murder his commandments in practice throughout the week. It's very possible to be outwardly worshiping and spiritually dead. And in fact, very often, an extreme focus on external worship is a sign that you're spiritually dead. Not always, but but very often. Hosea 8.14 says, Israel has forgotten his maker. And what do you do when you forget your maker? And built palaces. And that is so often what people do when they forget God. The more that the God is not a part of the real service, there's no heart there for him, the more elaborate the cathedral is the more fantastically entertaining the worship service becomes. But you see, the more that the worship is clearly designed to please the flesh, the, the senses, the more likely this is to be the, the product of people who are spiritually dead. Spurgeon said, it has been proven times without number that the most careful and zealous attention to external ceremonies is quite consistent with an absolute absence of any true apprehension of God or love to him. The conscious lack of inward and vital grace may drive a man to a more intense zeal in formalities in order to conceal his defect. So, God rejects outward worship that doesn't come from the heart, and he also rejects worship from people who reject his commandments. Look at verse 16. What right have you to recite my laws or take my covenant upon your lips? You hate my instruction, and you cast my words behind you. Sounds a lot like 2 Kings, isn't it, where it says they worship the Lord, but they also worship their own gods. You hate my instruction, you cast my words behind you. Now, you might be sitting here and thinking, well, you know, I'm worried about that because, you know, frankly, there are times I disobey God and cast his word behind me. Well, that's true, and, you know, all Christians sadly do that from time to time. But 
do you always do this as a lifestyle? The reason being is because you hate God's instruction. God says in verse 17, you hate my instruction and cast my words behind you. And of course, the answer is if you're a believer, that's not why you do it. You don't hate God's instruction. Okay, thirdly, God rejects worship from people who are just basically dishonest people. Verse 18, when you see a thief, you join in with him. You know, Proverbs 11 verse 1 says, The Lord abhors dishonest scales, but accurate weights are his delight. That's talking about your morality in, this, in, the, in the marketplace. You know, in a way, we're all somewhat dishonest. Uh, I was reading somebody who wrote, he said, If I were entirely honest every time I sang a hymn or a gospel song, here's how some of the old favorites would be titled. I surrender some. I, I love to talk about telling the story. Take my life and leave me be. Where he leads me, I will genuinely consider following. <laughs> well, that is not what is being spoken about here. He says, when you, when you see a thief, you join in him. You know why? Because you're a thief. That's the best description of it. You're basically a dishonest person. If you're basically a dishonest person in your work, you, you give out what they call a false prospectus on your business. If it's wrong, you'll do it if it'll profit from it. You could come on Sunday and worship and God is not receiving it. Fourth, God rejects your worship from people who are immoral. Verse 18, second half, you throw in your lot with adulterers. I thought, what can I say about this? Well, may I simply say, and it's surely no exaggeration, that if our standard of acceptable entertainment is exactly the same as the culture around us, this, you know, Western American culture, we're throwing our lot in with adulterers. Fifth, God also rejects worship from people who are gossips. And you think, how did that get in there? How, why is that if one of God's criteria for, 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 that would, would disqualify a person from, from getting through to God with worship? Well, if you think about it, worship is, we read, with the mouth. Well, this is not a mouth that can also be given to sin habitually. Uh, in fact, if you go to James chapter 3, it talks about exactly that, which is that you, you can't, you can't, sinning with the mouth is, is not appropriate for believers because your salt water and fresh water shouldn't be coming out of the same place. Look at verse 19. You use your mouth for evil and harness your tongue to deceit. You speak continually against your brother and you slander your own mother's son. If, you don't, if you're a gossip, if you talk badly about people behind their back, uh, you, you, God says, when you come on Sunday, I'm not listening to you. I don't receive that kind of worship. In Psalm 101, verse 5, God says, whoever slanders his neighbor secretly, I will destroy. Wow. Uh, well, it's not just God who's going to destroy you. you you'll, other people will destroy you. If, if they catch you gossiping. I remember my, my, my son once told me that he was in the men's bathroom with a workmate who was speaking very poorly about the boss. And John said at that moment, he felt very strongly what he now believes was the Holy Spirit who was pressing on him, do not join in. And instead, he gave him an admonition from Matthew 18 and said, look, uh, you got a problem with the boss? I don't have a problem with the boss. Don't tell me. If you got a problem with the boss, don't tell anybody else. Just go straight to the boss. Tell him. Which is exactly what Matthew 18 tells you you're supposed to do. Well, it turned out that the boss was in the stalls and heard every single word of it. And, at, and my son only found that out because later he came to my son and said, I want to really thank you for showing that kind of integrity. And John said he got a lesson from God that day, and he said, I'll never speak badly about anybody behind their back. If I want to speak badly about someone, I'm going to go right to their face and tell them this is, this is the way it is. I'm not going to do that anyway. And God made that very clear. During his last year of office, Sir Winston Churchill was uh, attending an official ceremony. And just one row behind him were two guys, two gentlemen, I, I suppose, who were whispering. And they went, oh, look, it's, it's Sir Winston Churchill. Oh, you know, they say he's gone senile. You know, they, they say he should step aside and, and leave the running of the nation to more younger and more dynamic people. That's what they say. 
Well, when the ceremony was over, so Winston Churchill turned to them and he said, gentlemen, they also say he's deaf. <laughs> Gossiping is, is going to destroy you. And a more, more serious point that we must uh, arrive at is, is that God doesn't want worship from mouths that just are used to tear your brothers and sisters and everybody else down. Um, <clears throat> Now, let's look very briefly at the uh, worship that is acceptable to God. Of course, first of all, it's worship that is accompanied by heartfelt thanksgiving. Verse 13, do I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? In other words, you, you're doing all that, your sacrifices, there, there's something, it's fine, I don't really have a problem with them, but, but that's not what does it for me. No, sacrifice, thank offerings to God. I don't just want your outward worship. <clears throat> I want your heartfelt thanksgiving. This, of course, requires that the worshiper knows God, that is born again, and born again through faith in what Jesus did on the cross. So they have been made alive to God because they heard the gospel, that Jesus died on the cross, their sins were placed on Christ, he suffered the punishment in their place, that whosoever believes on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And, and then God makes you alive to him. Then you know him personally. It, it, it's, it's a magnificent transformation. Those are the people that can worship. Look, look at verse 5. God says, gather to me my consecrated ones who have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. They've come to know me through faith in my son's death on the cross. So, so we're not talking about heartfelt thanksgiving that occurs only on Sunday. It's a heartfelt thanksgiving throughout all the week. First Thessalonians 5.18 says, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Let me give you another John Piper quote, student of Jonathan Edwards. Uh, he says, when God asks us to worship him, he's not being vain. He's setting at the center of our lives the one reality that will satisfy our souls forever, and that is himself. He's only summoning us to rejoice in and be thankful for the gift which is supremely valuable. That is his own perfection. So, Worship that's acceptable to God is worship that is accompanied by heartfelt thanksgiving. Psalm 100 verse 4 says, We enter his gates with, with, with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Secondly, it's worship where you come before God and you are submitting your life to God. Look at verse 14. Sacrifice thank offerings to God. Fulfill your vows to the Most High. You know, Ecclesiastes 5, 4 says, whenever you make a vow, do not delay in fulfilling it. But what we're talking about here is he's talking about true worship that involves in a submission to God where you give God what is due. What is due to God? Everything, your commitment of your whole life. In fact, one of the words that is often used, that is, that's a Greek word that's translated in the Bible as worship, is proskunio, and it literally means to bow down, prostrate, prostrate oneself, and kiss the hand. Psalm 95, verse 6, Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our Maker. So worship that isn't, isn't a process of submitting yourself to God is not acceptable to God. That is what God is looking for. And that's, of course, then you realize it can't, worship just can't be a, a thing that occurs on Sunday because it has to be a, a weekly, daily obedience, a bowing of ourselves down before him. That's worship. Um, worship that is accompanied by thanksgiving. That's what he wants. Worship that is accompanied by your surrender to God. And thirdly, another thing you would never guess, praying to God in a crisis. Look at verse 14. You just think, how did that get in there? Sacrifice. What I want is that sacrifice, you to sacrifice thank offerings to God, fulfill your vows to the Most High, and thirdly, call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver you, and you will honor me. 
Now, did you know that? Because I didn't. Is, is how remarkable that God considers one of the great forms of worship, a tribute to him, is crying out in times of trouble. That is considered by God here to be precious worship. Crying out to God in times of trouble, but wait a minute, I mean, loads of people who don't care less about God never go to church. Actually, atheists, they'll cry out to God in times of trouble if you turn the heat up enough. I mean, isn't that the old saying, no atheists in foxholes? Yeah, but a lot of them who are crying out in the foxhole aren't offering thanksgiving. They're not surrendering themselves to God. Of course, if they were, nothing wrong in learning who God is in a foxhole. And because he, he will accept it. But, but why is this so precious to God? Well, I suppose because, I, I suppose because it means that, that your hope is in him. Read it in the first person. I will call upon him in the day of my trouble, and he will deliver me, and I will honor him. There's, a, there's an absolute faith, a turning of your hope to God. Psalm 37, verse 39, verse 7, David, who the Bible tells us we know is a man after God's own heart, says, but now, O Lord, what do I look for? It's for you. My hope is in you. So this is the confidence in him that God desires when your heart is right with God like David's heart. So, so he considers that as worship. Another reason is crying out to God in times of crisis means your hope is in him, but you know it also means that you trust in God even in times of trouble. There's a lot of folks who have a Pollyanna faith that really only trust in God when everything's going fine and everything's happy. But as soon as something goes wrong now, we're immediately super, su sus we're suspicious of his goodness. Whereas trusting God in times of trouble when everything isn't going right is all important to God. You know, uh, there's a story about Alexander the Great who had his great friend who also happened to be his physician. But boy, he trusted his friend. And, and, and this physician, friend of his, had mixed a, a medicine for Alexander because he was sick, and he had placed the medicine by Alexander's bed for him to drink. Well, just before he drank it, a letter was delivered to Alexander that said and warned him that his physician had been bribed to poison him, and he had probably put the poison in the medicine. Well, so Alexander read that letter and he summoned in his physician friend, stood him before him, and when he came in and stood before him, Alexander immediately drank the potion and then handed him his letter. Considered through historians as an amazing act of confidence to risk his whole life trusting in his friend's faithfulness, that he would never have done that. And, and you see, that same confidence God sees in us when we demonstrate trust in him when our lives are in peril. Notice finally the great promise. Call upon me in the days of trouble and I will deliver you and you will honor me. You notice God does not say, and I might deliver you. We'd like to stick that in because our trembling faith can hardly believe and claim what it is that God says here. He says, I will deliver you. You know that Paul had this view of God, that he, he'll, he'll, he'll deliver us. Yep, he'll deliver us. In 2 Corinthians 1.10, he said, the Lord has delivered us from this deadly peril, and he will deliver us. On him we've said our hope that he will continue to deliver us. Well, that's not true because, you know, didn't he get martyred? Yeah, he got delivered from this rotten life and taken straight to God's bosom in heaven. He's going to deliver you this way. He's going to deliver you that way. He'll deliver you this way. He'll deliver you through this. He'll deliver you by this. And one day he'll deliver you upwards. Why would God deliver little old me, though? Here's what he says. I will deliver you and you will honor me. I'm going to deliver you so that you're going to glorify me. Uh, it is my will to deliver you because it will actually increase your worship of me when you receive my goodness. What a great view of God. He's my rock. He's my fortress. He, he delivers 
occasionally. No, that, that doesn't make a song. And he's my deliverer. So worship is what you were saved for. So that you will, it's the purpose of your lives, both now and in eternity. And the kind of worship that God accepts is offered by true believers who have made a covenant with God through sacrifice, through faith in his son, who now know God. And when they come to him, they come with a heartfelt thanksgiving. They fulfill with their commitments to the Most High, that is, they bow before him and they call upon him. They turn to him in times of trouble. He's the first person they turn to. And God's promise is, because you worship me, because you trust me, I will deliver you and you will honor me. You will worship me all the more. Peter says in 1 Peter 2, 9, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging, belonging to God that, here's why, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Amen, amen, and amen, and may we be those people. Let's pray.